be talking about treatment planning system commissioning for HDR brachytherapy. Although I am from University of Maryland at Baltimore currently, I've been here only like an year, year and a half or so. Uh, all the relevant brachytherapy experience that I'm going to talk about today is from my previous work at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. All right, so the learning objectives here are going to be see, you know, at the end of the talk, if we have some information about commissioning a treatment planning system. And that includes the dose calculation algorithm, the source specification, data input and export, geometrical validation, applicator reconstruction, optimization methods, and dose calculation, the validation of the dose calculation and deviate the display. At the end, we also want to recognize any potential limitations of the treatment planning system as well. Again, please feel free to interrupt and ask questions at any point of time. I, I won't mind it at all. So we can broadly classify the commissioning process in two, across two categories. One of them being non-dosimetric tests and then dosimetric tests. By that, I mean anything that is not directly affecting the actual dosimetry or the modeling is a non-dosimetric test. That includes input of data, export of data into and out of the treatment planning system. The actual geometrical validation, and by this we mean in 3D space, how accurately are we able to model both the applicator and the anatomy that the applicator actually goes in? And then of course, once we have done with validation of that part, the important thing is to then be able to assess the accuracy of the dose calculation, the source specification, any optimization methods, and you know other features of the treatment planning system. So if the geometric tests are not accurate, then it follows that the dosimetric tests will not yield the correct results. So it's both, both of these steps are critically important in the commissioning of a planning system. And so as far as these non-dosimetric tests, you have some basic data input and output validation. As we all are aware, the input for data input for a typical bracket therapy dose calculation can be either 2D or 3D. So it could be like a film or it could be like a 2D ultrasound image or it could be 3D, meaning CT or MR. And sometimes we do use like fusion between CT and MR to get to where we want to be. The geometrical validation also has to test the image accuracy. And especially in the case of phantoms or not phantoms, other applicators that we use in brachytherapy, these applicators do tend to distort both of the anatomy and the imaging as well, because these applicators are not made of, so to say, you know, natural soft tissue materials. Sometimes they're going to include other materials which can potentially distort both CT and MR images. So it is important to understand these distortions. And then the applicator reconstruction process itself. A lot of the centers still use a manual reconstruction process. Some of these later versions of the treatment planning systems do offer an automatic applicator reconstruction or a modeling process. They also have applicator libraries or models based on various applicators that are provided by the manufacturers. And then of course, once we have done with all of this, the output, okay, what, what, what is the output, both in terms of a record of the treatment plan and also the output that is being sent to the afterloader, you know, how, how is that going to be validated? So those are all things that we need to be looking at. So as I mentioned before, the data input process is essentially checking the successful transfer of imaging data sets from the CT or MR. Basically make sure that there are no errors in during the import and that all demographic information about the patient is also successfully transferred. And then of course you carefully review all the images to make sure that there are no visual distortions or artifacts that may interfere with either the contouring or with the dose calculation process. And of course, if you're using film, we have to check the accuracy of the digitizer input into the treatment planning system. Now, the, the, the QA programs for all imaging equipment should be used and you know, that are used for the treatment planning must be maintained, right? So any imaging equipment that is feeding information into the planning system, we have to make sure that there is routine quality assurance that is done on that. As far as geometrical validation, it's all fine for us to, you know, ensure that the import process goes on very well. But once the data is into the treatment planning system, we have to make sure that the, first of all, that the patient orientation is correct. 
the slice thickness is correct and we're strictly talking 3d images here the image geometry and by this we mean when we scan phantoms of known dimensions and we import them when we actually try and model this in the planning system or contour over the planning system those geometries should be accurately reproduced within the planning system and the tolerance usually for that is around a millimeter it is not necessary to check the ct hounsfield units if you're using aapm tg43 calculation algorithms okay and we will come to that in a little bit more detail as we go through the rest of the talk but regardless of whatever planning system or whatever dose calculation algorithm is available with the treatment planning system we strongly recommend that we check the performance of the treatment planning system against a TG43 or a similar formalism, you know, wherever you're located. And then the contouring tools themselves, you know, what are the different contouring tools that are provided by the planning system? And we use those tools to provide contours of a known volume to check and check that the reconstructed volume is actually correct and the TPS is, is accurate. And then we also check these expansions to make sure that when we expand these known contours, those dimensions are also correct. And then we also have to verify that the, the projection of a contour on a specific image orientation makes sense in all the other image orientations. So for example, if, if, you, if you know that there is a contour in the axial or transverse slice, how does it look in the coronal or even on the, on the sagittal slice? Is it where it is supposed to be and does it have the right shape? Uh, and the volume. And then if there are any auto contouring tools that are available, also verify that, you know, those tools work correctly. It's not a huge necessity, but, you know, if you want to check that, you can always scan. And of course, verify the point placement. Sorry, was there a question? I don't think so. Okay. So we verify the point placement and make sure that, for example, if we're doing like GYN Bracky, we want to localize point A, point B, rectal and bladder points correctly. And then it is, it is important that after we are done with all of this, we are then able to reconstruct the applicator because our source essentially travels and rests within this applicator throughout the treatment. And that's how the treatments are delivered. So, you know, there are different applicators and there are different phantoms of known geometry that have been used. Each manufacturer also lists some recommendations for, you know, what to use to QA these things. And there are task groups reports that are also available that recommend some methods to do the verification of applicator reconstruction. Essentially, we can digitize the application reconstruction from film, or you can do a manual re applicator reconstruction on the CT or the MR data set using some tools that are provided by the planning system. There is also an automated reconstruction based on applicator tracking. These rely on some, you know, you know possibly uh, machine learning related tools uh, in the more recent models. But regardless, you know, in each center can choose whichever is the most easiest and consistent way in which they want to do this. One thing to remember is that for every applicator, you, know, you want to check that the applicator offset. And by offset, we mean this is the distance from the tip of the applicator to where the first source dwell position will be. That 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 is correctly represented in the reconstruction because any differences there could mean inaccuracies in the dose calculation. And also we want to make sure that the dwell positions within the applicator are also correctly spaced as desired by, by us, you know, depending upon whichever applicator that we are going to use. So once we have verified that the applicator modeling is accurate and satisfactory as per our needs, then we have to go back and check that the treatment plan is actually accurately printed out on paper. So this is actually another step after the plan is done. So we will come to the actual plan after I'm done talking with this. This slide is essentially talking about what happens once you have a plan already. So you want to make sure that that treatment plan that is accurately printed on paper matches what is there in the planning system. And then once you have exported the data to the actual treatment console, we're going to use this printed sheet or uh, or a PDF, depending upon whichever is the process, to compare these parameters against what is represented at the treatment console. So you want to be making sure that these parameters, like the source strength, the dwell times, dwell positions, and channel lengths, you know, they all transfer accurately. All right. So uh, I guess this is the time for the first poll question. Which orientation can an applicator be reconstructed in the treatment planning system. 
from a CT data set. And the choices are axial, coronal, sagittal, or any of the above. So uh, I guess we'll just take that poll now. All right, uh, the poll should be launched if anyone's having difficulty, but it looks like we're getting some answers in. Yes, we are. We'll give it like 30 more seconds for people to answer the question. We'll give 10 more seconds or so. And if you don't answer the question in time, no worries at all. We'll just go over the answers afterwards. Sure. All right. So it looks like we have some convergence. So um, let me see if I can move this window. So, are you able to see the, uh, the results of the poll there? I personally see yeah. that myself sharing the poll, so I'm not sure what other people can see. Oh, got it, got it. <laughs> All right. Never mind. So the, the, the results converge to about 40% of you all saying that any of the above views should be good for the reconstruction. And indeed, that is the answer that we were looking for. So the answer is any of the above. Now, you can, of course, you know, most people do typically use the axial or the sagittal view to reconstruct initially, and then they verify it you know, by looking at the other views as well. So I won't say any of those answers are incorrect, <laughs> but the, the, the answer is, yeah, you can use any of the reconstructions from any of these views. All right, moving on. So now we go to the meat of the subject, which is dosimetric tests. So I'm assuming, you know, more, you know, most participants or, or some participants are familiar with the AMTG43 formalism for brachytherapy dose calculations. If not, that task group report, I believe, is available as a free document. So I would encourage all of you to download it and have a read. And that's essentially the for formalism that is followed across the United States and mostly Canada also, I presume. It talks about, you know, specify the source specification, accuracy of the input data, the source decay, air karma to activity conversion if needed, and the validation of the dose calculation, optimization methods, DVHs, all of these things. So these are all the tests that we need to do. But in the context of using the AAPM TG43 formalism to verify all of these things. So we'll go at it one by one. So what is this formalism telling us? Essentially what this is saying is, this is like an empirical way in which we determine what the dose at a point will be given a source of a particular source strength and a particular geometry, all right? And, you know, and so this calculation algorithm therefore is source specific because each source has a different encapsulation, a different isotope in there, uh, and a different geometry as well, and how it is placed. This report was actually first published in uh, 1995, and it received several updates after that. But the important thing to note is that the dose rate that is shown here is actually calculated in water, and tissue heterogeneity is actually not corrected for. So that's something that we all have to remember. And if you look at the formalism a little bit more closely, you have the dose rate, which is essentially what we're looking at, the dose rate the, at a point at a specific distance from a source at a particular orientation, right? So that's an essentially dependent on the air karma strength, the dose rate constant, a geometry function, which incorporates the inverse square law, but does not include any self-absorption of the photon scattering within the source structure. And then the radial function as well, this accounts for dose fall off due to the photon scattering and attenuation of water along the transverse axis of the source. It does exclude the dose fall off due to the inverse square law. And then you have a 2D anisotropy function because the scattering in different planes is different, right? And so that essentially accounts for the way in which the source is built as a, you know, if, if you have like a proper spherical source, the anisotropy is one because it's the same in any direction. Whereas cylindrical sources have a certain anisotropy factor, especially if the dose calculation region that you're interested in is going to be close enough to the source. All right. So this is an example of what the geometry function will look like. So for a, for a point source approximation, as I mentioned before, it's essentially the inverse square. But for a line source, you also have to take into account the projection of the angle uh, that is subtended 
by that point at the source. As I mentioned before, this TG43 algorithm does not incorporate uh, any tissue in homogeneity. It only calculates dose in water. The general perception, at least clinically, is that the inhomogeneity correction is mostly unnecessary due to the inverse square law having a much greater influence on the dose than anything else. Uh, but again, you know, with, with, uh, with more advances in automated treatment planning and inverse optimization, it is more easier now to generate, to include uh, heterogeneity corrections than it was in the years past. So if centers feel like they want to do that, by all means they can, but right? that's a decision that is best left to each facility. But at the very least, we want to try and make sure that whatever commissioning we do is at least consistent with the TG43 formulas. And all these sources, all these parameters that, you, that are mentioned in the TG43 report are source and manufacturer specific. And this data has been generated through, you know, th this has been either provided by the manufacturer or through consensus. So the, the way this works is each manufacturer, when they come up with a new source, they get into a relationship with an academic institution or, you know, or a radiation therapy facility. And they go about getting some measurements and modeling the results and then try to match that with whatever parameters that they have. Now, if you do this only at one side, you could say that, well, maybe there is some systematic bias there. So as a result, they develop relationships with several institutions and combine the measurement data from all of those institutions and come up with consensus data on the source parameters. And that's what you see in the TG43 report. And if there are any questions, of course, we are encouraged to talk to the manufacturer directly. So as an example, this is the consensus data and they typically provide tables for radial dose function, the dose rate constant and the anisotropic function for the specific kind of source that we would like to use. It is very important that the consensus data should match what is in the treatment planning system exactly. And, you know, uh, and this has to be checked periodically also. It's not as if you just do the commissioning once and say everything is okay, because as we all know, we deal with sources that decay over time, right? And so in, in addition to daily QA, we also have to do some periodic QA or you know, some sort of quarterly to make sure that our treatment planning system is still computing the dose correctly. It is strongly encouraged that every institution, when they implement a new treatment planning system for brachytherapy, have another independent manual dose calculation uh, performed to validate the dose in the treatment planning system. Now, this is both for the commissioning as well as for patient-specific QA. Again, we can use the TG43 formula, you know, just to do like a simple first-order calc, or there are lookup tables that are available also that you can use. And then we compare the manually calculated dose at various points around the source to the dose calculated for those same points in the treatment planning system. So this is just like a test run that you do and make sure that you're sort of verifying like a point check. Uh, and then for a multiple source calculation, we need to add the doses from individual sources at each individual calculation point, right? So that's how you get the, uh, the contribution from several different sources at a point. It is also strongly encouraged that we change the calculation grid size to get the best match to the manual calculation points as possible. Usually smaller is better. But then again, when an institution is dealing with different sources of different strengths, different you know, transmission characteristics, you want to make sure that whatever grid size you choose best matches the manual dose calculations that you're able to perform. Okay. Uh, we have a question. Sure. Um, a question from Evans. Is there an algorithm used in Breaky that accounts for homogeneity? Accounts for homogeneity or accounts for heterogeneity? We have homogeneity, but maybe we could answer it for both. Okay. Well, the, 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 like I said, the TG43 essentially does not include heterogeneity. So it basically considers everything water, right? On the flip side, newer treatment planning systems, I think the where uh, if, if I'm saying this right, there is this, which is a feature in the uh, where in treatment planning system which includes heterogeneity corrections, right? And again, those are based on some modeling also. And that, yeah. 
So the, the variant also does have some tools like that. But regardless, one has to go and make sure that whatever numbers are being provided by any of these tools actually makes sense. Okay, so whatever we do, we always have to go back to the GG43 or at least do like a simple hand cap to make sure that it makes sense. And also remember that anytime we include heterogeneities, we're not going to be too far away from what the homogeneous toe scouts give us because really in bracket therapy, in most instances, we're not going through bone, you know, soft tissue interfaces that much. So the effects shouldn't be that great. Other things like air pockets and all of these things that pose an issue for external beam treatment planning usually don't pose too much of an issue when we're doing brachytherapy. So it's also important to remember that when you have a dose calibration system that's based on homogeneity, correct, you know, correcting for heterogeneities versus not correcting for heterogeneities, if you're getting incredibly different numbers, you want to make sure that that makes sense because you know, unless there is like significant changes in the tissue anatomy where you're making the dose calculation, you shouldn't be seeing too many differences. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. And then for shielded applicators, the manufacturer should be able to provide a shielding at attenuation factor that can be used. And then there should be a model of the shielding in the treatment planning system that we can verify against the manufacturer guideline. So there are several methods, as I was mentioning before, to optimize a bracket therapy treatment plan. At MD Anderson, for as long as I was there, we were always doing manual adjustment of dwell time, so weights and positions, simply because this is what we were used to over a period of time. And we got so good at it that we didn't really see the need to use any of the graphical optimization tools. That being said, there are different graphical optimization tools. There are also geometrical optimization tools available in the different treatment planning systems. Most recently, you also have inverse optimization where you can just specify a dose to a certain region and just let the treatment planning system go around and calculate the dwell positions for us based on that. Kind of like, you know, IMRT for brachytherapy. So all these things are available, but each method needs to be tested to ensure that they work as intended. So what, what I would do is anytime we intend to use the graphical optimization or the geometrical optimization is to make sure that, you know, we do manual adjustment of dwell times first independently to generate a treatment plan and then use the graphical optimization tools to make sure that we're able to get consistent results or comparable results for the same prescription for the same applicator and for the same type of treatment. And so that's, that's a real quick and easy test that we can prove. As far as manual optimization goes, you know, you can use a single source dwell position and time and look at the various dose points around the source, or mainly at, you know, different distances and make sure that the planning system is giving you a number that makes sense. We also then can double the dwell time or weight. And in this case, the dose should double. And when you have the dwell time or weight, the dose should decrease by half, you know, things like that. As far as graphical optimization goes in this method, you can essentially click and drag the ISO dose lines and put them exactly where you want them. The dwell positions are fixed, but the dwell times and weights are automatically adjusted. Now, sometimes this can yield results that are good for us in terms of you know, operational consistency. And sometimes they can yield results that don't make too much sense. And so it's up to each individual institution to figure out what works best for them. And then we, we can always test this by using a single source dwell position plan, you know, and place the calculation points at the 50 and the 100% isodose lines and essentially move the isodose line, 100% isodose, isodose line further out, right? And then, you know, and then essentially measure you know, or, or see what the treatment plan system is actually giving you as far as dwell times go, right? And so based on that, if you see the dwell times moving in the right direction, you know that the treatment planning system is being modeled accurately, okay? So mainly we want to make sure that the inverse square law effect, which is the dominant influencer for dose calculations, works as intended. Dr. Vidal? Yeah. We have a question again from Evans. Thank you. It's more of a, a question and a request. He says, you talk about the manual calculations verification. Would you be able to give an example? Sure. That's a, that's a good question. So for example, let's go back here, right? So easiest thing to do is to actually just make a single source well position, 
anywhere in the applicator, right? And put dose points at various distances around the source, okay? At specific distances. So as shown in this picture here, you just you know, get it well positioned, activate it for like a certain amount of time. And the treatment planning system is gonna give you some sort of dose at a particular distance. <clears throat> and then you measure you know, whatever the treatment planning system is giving you as the dose, you then do a manual calculation using the TG43 formalism and then compare the dose that is provided by the planning system to your hand calculation. And that, that is a very quick test. Now that is just one point. You can repeat this by placing different points at different distances, okay? So that's just a single point test. And then now to take it even further, you can actually activate two or three dwell positions based on whatever you know, treatments that you're going to prescribe and, and look at the contribution from each of these to a certain point, right? So essentially you activate one, note down the dose, activate the other, note down the dose and activate the last one, note down the dose at that same point. And then you get a cumulative dose from all these, okay? And then you again model this using the hand calc and verify. So that way you've verified both the single source and a multiple source model for dose calculations. And then once you're done with it, you actually play with the weights as mentioned here, you know, increase the weight, does the dose increase at the same point? Decrease the weight, does the dose decrease at the same point? And then try and move the point away, you know, double the distance, what happens to the dose? And then have the distance, you know, what happens to the dose, things like that. Hopefully that answers the question. Thank you so much. No worries. And then the same thing with graphical optimization, you just, you know, put various points at the various isodose lines and make sure that whatever dose your treatment planning system is giving you is you know, verified by manual optimization or using a TG43 hand calculator. All right. And as far as geometrical optimization goes, in this method, we just you know, use the dwell positions within a treatment volume as points for optimization. And there are several ways this may work depending on the planning system. Right now, all the catheters and channels are included in the plan. In, in, you have to make sure that all these are included in the optimization and it gives a tight dose distribution around each catheter or channel. Uh, the catheter or channel on which the dwell position or target is located is not included in the optimization, it just fills the spaces between the catheters or channels. Okay, now I, I don't have too much experience with using the geometric optimization, I tried it out initially, but I quickly found out that I would be better off just using manual optimization. But if any of you are willing to try this out, by all means, just go ahead. What I've found is that this is often not a very useful tool in treatments that only have a small number of catheters or channels, for example, tandem and ovoids. This is actually more useful for interstitial implants that have many, many needles. And even then, you know, with our experience at MD Anderson, our dosimetrists have become so good after all these years of practice that they don't use this for interstitial implants either. You just find it too time consuming. Inverse optimization is the latest in a series of tools that are available for brachytherapy dose calculations. And like external beam you know, treatment planning in inverse optimization, you just specify the dose requirements for the different volumes. Like for example, the HRCTV or the bladder or the rectum in a gynecological treatment. And then like geometric optimization, this tool is not particularly helpful if you only have a small number of catheters or channels to work with. But like I said, uh, you know, it could be useful for interstitial implants to generate reasonable dose distribution very quickly. But again, this has to be verified in a manner, manner that is consistent uh, you know, with the institution's expectations. The, Main thing to remember here that for any of these things to work, the contouring of the HRCTV and the various OARs is actually even more critical. And that essentially also means that whatever imaging modality we are using to draw these contours has to represent or has to provide enough information to us that we can generate these contours in as accurate a manner as possible. Now remember with some of these GYN applicators that are big, they introduce artifacts, especially in the areas where we want to do the dose calculations. So as long as you know we are, we are able to get reasonable images without too many artifacts, you know, this inverse optimization will help us. 
But again, this is something that every institution has to prepare for and plan for. As far as testing both these approaches go, it is, it's sort of difficult to define specific tests to, you know, it's almost like saying, how do I test whether my IMRT, you know, inverse optimization algorithm for external beam is working? Well, even an external beam, what we do is you calculate a dose distribution, you know, from an inverse optimization procedure, and you measure the dose at a certain point. You know, you just do like patient specific QA at particular points and say that, okay, well, it seems like everything is looking good. Or you feed the data from that optimization into another treatment planning system and help it, you know, and have that other treatment planning system recalculate the dose or recompute the dose for the same parameters. And then you compare those two dose distributions and say, okay, well, now I get results from two independent planning systems and they're giving me the same result and therefore you know, it should be good. With bracket therapy, it's a little more complicated and it involves you know, a lot of time with the planning system to determine what the best input values are to generate the most useful clinical treatment plans. And that comes, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, with experience, which I honestly do not have at this point. But if in, in future talks, if anyone experience with inverse optimization or, or geometric optimization, um, I'll, I'll gladly listen and learn. We have another great question. Sure. A question from Moses. Which optimization method or methods can call for the use templates, especially in busy clinics, but with limited resources? Oh, good question. So pretty much most of these treatment planning systems allow you to save any plan as a template, right? So if you're using a certain applicator, for example, a tandem for a, a specific kind of tandem and OI, you can save that. Like once you've done it once, you can actually save that and then use the same template. And, and if you're using a standard loading scheme, for example, as far as uh, activating the sources inside goes, that can also be saved as a template. In addition to this, some of these treatment planning systems actually do provide default templates that you can basically place onto the planning system. And so these tools are all available. At Anderson, again, what we found was that we had templates on an as-needed basis. So we just identified which treatments we do the most, and then we would create templates with those, and those would involve like simple, straightforward treatments. And anything else, it would be essentially manually created on the fly. Hope that answers the question. Thanks so much. And the dose volume histograms, you know, the difference between BRACI and external beam again is that there is a there is a bit of a complex nature to these dose distributions. So we have to be extra careful trying to validate these. You know, a simple test can be performed by placing dose points around the surface and inside a 10 millimeter spherical volume that is created around a single dwell position. And then we can normalize the 100% isodose line as closely as possible to the surface. And when we do that, the dose points on the sphere should all be at 100%, right? And then you look at the volume encompassed by the 100% isodose line compared to the volume of the sphere. And they should roughly be identical, right? So this is the easiest way in which we can test the, the accuracy of the dose volume histogram. The challenge with Brachy is that you, you're not going to have an ideal dose fall off like with the external beam because we want, we're not aiming the beam from different directions at the target, right? We, we are actually, we, our, our target is to, our, our source rather is actually at the center. And then you are trying to calculate those at the point from the radiation that's emanating from these sources. And so the, the fall off, you know, the, the point where you pick the size of those lines should, should make sense when you're doing this test. But that's essentially the test that I would do to make sure that now, whatever I said, those lines are being depicted actually represent you know, what we think it is. Um, Another question. Yeah. From Abdullah. Can we do the optimize the description dose without putting input of point A and B? Yeah, absolutely. You, you can absolutely do that. So point A and B, normally when you do you know, manual optimization, that's exactly what you're doing. You're, you're actually specifying dwell times at these different dwell locations. And then looking at the point A and point B doses, right? So that's the classic way in which we've always been doing bracket therapy, which is manual optimization. 
And then, of course, the reverse is you can always specify, you know, point eight doses or volume doses and do the inverse optimization, and that will give you the dwell time as well. Yes. And then there's this question about relative and absolute dose. You know, these can also be validated by doing manual dose calculations of a single source at various points, you know, moving outwards from the source. And then the relative dose can then be verified against a dose normalized to one of these calculation points. So by verifying the relative dose, all you're doing is saying, okay, is the treatment planning system correctly modeling the dose? So now it is time for our second question. Why isn't tissue and homogeneity corrected for in the APM TG43 algorithm? And then we have these four choices. We'll give people some time to answer this. Okay, the poll is launched. Okay, let's give it like 20 more seconds. Sure. Okay, and I'm gonna end the poll. It's okay if you didn't get a chance to answer it. We'll just go over the answers now. All right, perfect. So yeah, over 50% of you said that it is because of the inverse square law effect. Again, all these answers are correct to varying degrees, but the best answer is that, yes, it is the inverse square law. That's the major contributor to the dose fall off. And therefore the other, you know, things like tissue and inhomogeneity do not, you know, they, they don't make a big difference to the dose calculations. Now, the other answers are also true to varying degrees. Yeah, you can say that the applicator is not tissue that is mostly homogeneous. Yes, that is true for most of most of the time. But again, in some instances, that may not be true. And, you know, because we can plan on MR, ultrasound, and other octagonal images, not only CT. Yes, that is also true. You know, before we had CT, we were actually using film to do these calculations. And so in film, you obviously did not have the ability to correct for heterogeneities, and you're still able to get reasonable, you know, reasonable dose calculations. And historically, we have actually been, you know, even these concepts of point A and point B, especially in GeoAN bracket therapy, came from film dose calculations or film-based dose calculations. He uh, says that because the calculation is source and vendor specific, we don't need to. Not entirely. We still need to verify, that, you know, uh, if, if the vendor does provide tools for inhomogeneity corrections, then you know, we verify that. But in general, we always use those calculations that are agnostic to tissue heterogeneities. Very good. All right, we have a couple of more slides here. So these essentially summarize what we've been talking about and some most important steps. So when you're asked to do a uh, commissioning for a brachytherapy treatment planning system, you start off by you know doing the geometric verification and then the verification of the dose calculation. This will also mean you've actually looked at the various plan evaluation tools and you know the different output, different optimization processes. The output that you generate at the end from the uh, treatment planning system has to be verified. And the transfer of this information from the planning system to the actual treatment delivery console, all the way to end of the actual treatment to the to the actual delivered treatment. So that's essentially your end-to-end -end test. And then that would complete the commissioning of a treatment planning system. While we are doing this, of course, it is also important to understand the limitations of the treatment planning system. As we have mentioned several times, APM PG43 is essentially a formalism for calculating dose in water and therefore does not include tissue and homogeneity. The source specifications must agree with consensus data. If it doesn't, there has to be very good justification for why you know, we use the data that we use. And of course, if there are inaccuracies in this, this is going to affect every patient treatment, right? So it's important to remember that. It is also important to remember that the accuracy of the applicator reconstruction is limited by the imaging data that we use and also whether any applicator models or libraries are available. I don't completely agree with that second part of the statement, but for the first part, yeah, you know, if you have high quality uh, MR data sets or even ultrasound or that will essentially help us reconstruct the applicator better than if you had like very noisy data. So brachytherapy is not, you know, independent of that. And as physicists practicing brachytherapy, we also have to make sure that we are at the treatment console when we set up the image uh, acquisition process to make sure that the CT imaging parameters or the MR imaging parameters offer us the best quality image data set uh, that is possible for brachytherapy. And uh, that that also and and, and 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 you know recent advances in CT like low contrast CT or dual energy CT 
you know, they also have not been explored or Braki. And there's a lot of work that can be done in those areas as well, if those tools are available at, at, at your centers. Even with regular CT, you know, with, you know, things like Omar, you know, a re a reconstruction for when you have high density objects, all these different algorithms, those have not been QA'd very often. So there is plenty of opportunities there to develop those processes and get, get us the best imaging information that we can. And then of course, this essentially means that, you know, when we have good imaging data, that leads to good and accurate anatomical contouring, which is extremely important. And then these are just some references uh, that we've listed. By no means are they comprehensive, but at least they provide a good starting point. Thank you.